Hello everyone, welcome to William and the Magic Box. Today on our show, we are going to have Steve. Steve is from London in the UK. So let's see what Steve has to say. Enjoy the interview. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Stephen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for taking the time for the interview. Thank you. No worries. Thanks. <laughs> Have you been? Are you enjoying the sunny in London? The warm days? It's been gorgeous today. I've even got a wee little bit of sunburn on my nose, which is <laughs> and kind of because I always wear this bandana. I always get like a big white stripe across here and like a tan from down there. <laughs> I think summer this year it came a little bit earlier. Oh, I'm absolutely fine with that. <laughs> it's been, I mean, it's been dark and miserable for so long now. Time to bit of sunshine. We're good. I know I was checking the, the forecast last week and I was like, oh my God, 17, 19 uh, degrees in London next week. It's probably no, impossible. Right? It's impossible. <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> right, Stephen, tell me, uh, talking about summer, about good weather, uh, what do you like? The, what's the best part of spending a summer in London, in your opinion? Um, what do you like the most? Spend, spending a summer in London can be quite stifling. Um, Because there's, even though London's a really big place, there's a lot of people all in one place going to the same places. Uh, and it gets really packed. It's like we have some beautiful parklands uh, and we have some lovely pieces of countryside in it, but everybody goes to it. So it's always extremely busy. The best thing about <laughs> having a summer in London is getting out of London and going to the coast. <laughs> Right, and um, um, are you originally from London or where are you from? No, no, no. So I'm from the East Midlands, which is a little bit more north, um, from a place just outside of Nottingham. Oh, okay, and how long have you been living in London for? Um, this time around just over five years. So I travelled a lot when I was younger, um, settled back in Nottingham. And mm -hmm. then went from Nottingham to Oxford, to London, then all the way up to Edinburgh, and then back down to London again. <laughs> and in September, I should be going back to Edinburgh. Wow. And all your family are back in the Midlands? Yes. I see. Cool. And uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, so I do a couple of things. I run a really cool jazz pub um, in London. Um, it's a live music pub. Wow. And I write and publish dreadful, dreadful novels that nobody reads. <laughs> I think I'll be more deaf, I think. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, seriously. I, I actually hold the title of holding... I am the UK's worst-selling novelist of 2012. <laughs> <laughs> There's always I'm a title. I'm proud of that. <laughs> Absolutely. There's always a, a title for everything. There's always a, you know... Achievement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I great, right? I mean, I'm going to take that title from there. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your jazz pub, or about your business. Okay, so it's in a place called Angel. Um, it's a really small little pub, but it's um, Louisianan themed. So the food is all Cajun and Creole. Um, my entire back bar is all um, kind of like southern um, rye and bourbons and really expensive whiskies. And um, we do a lot of live music, so a lot of jazz, a lot of blues. Uh, and it's a good wee place. It's, it's, it's very, very small, but extremely busy. It's, it's a gorgeous little pub and it's right on the canal, um, on by Regent's Canal. Um, and it's a great little place. I love it. I'm very fond of it. Amazing. And why um, jazz music? Uh, is a passion of yourself or was just about the business? No, not at all. So, um, privately owned um, and one of the owners, his family heritage is Louisiana. So this was his, this was his really, like, okay, I, I, I'm going to own this pub. I don't want to have anything to do with it. But I just want to own it. And this is going to be a homage to my family history. I see. Very good. Okay, so for the join, I'm going to explore a little bit more about your business, about your books and your novels as well. Sure. <laughs> no Are you ready to go on a beautiful journey through your memories in life and to share your point of views? Sure, why not? Amazing. Welcome yeah. to William and the Magic Box. So I have here my lovely box. Full 
of run the fun questions, okay? I'm just gonna play a song now, just for us to move a little bit. I know already you got a beer already, already getting the mood. Before yeah, the first time, you, you, you go ahead. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> okay, Steven, so just before the game, you start the game, through the, the journey, if there is a question that uh, you don't want to talk about for some reason, you don't want to answer, I always can change, okay? All okay. her friends. First question for you is, what does money mean to you? Uh, I mean, I mean that's the, the eternal question, isn't it? Money's great if you've got it. Don't miss it if I don't. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you believe that money can bring happiness? Uh, no, it can buy nice things. It doesn't necessarily buy happiness. <laughs> Very good. Second question. Let's do it. Okay, Stephen from London. Next question is, who is a celebrity you admire and why? Show me, who is that? Tina Turner. Oh, wow, <laughs> look at that. Wow, Tina Turner. Love her. Um, as a whole, I'm not overly impressed with celebrity, but I think she's definitely one celebrity I should never meet. <laughs> I see. Have have been her concert before? Yeah, I've been to I I've been, I've been to four or five of her concerts. Uh, I've seen her in Amsterdam, in London, Barcelona. Um, love a Tina concert. What, what's up? Uh, tell me about a little bit about her concert. What's the best part? She always brings energies. Uh, all that said, it's just it's always really high octane. It's you know it's always a couple of hours. Because her concerts are quite simple as well. There's not a huge amount in terms of like distractions on like different videos and things. It's usually just her on a stage. Okay. Screaming and shouting and just kind of <laughs> owning it. And her costume changes are like that. They're like they're like two minutes long. Um, wow. and they're just they're a lot of fun. They're really exhausting. Uh, you always you always come away with it the next day with concert voice where you can't really talk properly because you've been singing so because you've been singing along all night. Wow, and uh, and she um, th there is now. I think there is a play now about. Her. I don't know if it's happening now before yeah, they. they... There's a, um, a musical um, yes. based on yep. a life that she wrote and produced, uh, which is really good. I went to, I went to it on the opening week, um, and it's got Adrian Warren playing um, Tina. It's a really good choice for for a lead on it. It's a really good show. Um, uh, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, I've got a, a very good friend of mine. Uh, we used to work in a hotel before, and uh, he met her. Like she was. Uh, uh, actually, she, he didn't meet her, but she, he knew that she was with her husband at the time in this room, and they were the room service. And um, stalking. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. So he went. To the, so he went to the room with the the, the order was dinner, and um, he went to the room. And uh, I don't remember the situation, but he asked her husband um, if they need something else, like an extra something else. And she was in the bathroom, and she and he he went like he went like, honey, do you do you like this or that? And she was like. Oh yes, please, baby. <laughs> like her, he said, really, her voice, like from this was this very powerful, strong voice. Was she on the toilet at the time? <laughs> I think I don't know if she was like in the bathroom just because she knew somebody was coming. Do you know what I mean? Kind of, I don't, I, uh, I don't yeah. know, but yeah, I think it was that. And she and he said, really, I just could hear her voice saying, "Yes, baby, I would like some." And uh, he said, it was powerful. I said, wow, that's is Tina Turner. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'd have a chat with Tina in the bathroom. I, I'd be perfectly fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> and when you start your passion about her, when was the, the, the first memories that you, you had when you started loving her? Oh, God, a long time ago. I mean, I, been, cause I can remember I grew up with her because my, my parents liked her music. So I can remember growing up listening to her with my parents. Um, and I think it just kind of stemmed from that. And especially as you get a little bit older and then you you kind of recognize songs and you can put a face to the name. And it's just, I, I think I've always been just a really big Tina fan. Um, you know, <laughs> it's just as I got older, it just got a lot bigger. Very good. Next question. Let's do it, Stephen. Okay, so before the next question, tell me a little bit about your novels. What's the inspiration um, to write no your novels? Tell me a little bit about it. 
Um, well, I've always been a really big reader. Um, I've always read. Um, I have a I have a huge book collection. Um, I kind of I have two book collections. I have my um, my essential book collection, which is my book collection that travels with me. And then I have the rest of my book collection, which when I finally buy my own place, I'm going to need an entire bedroom just for the books. So I'm going to need to create my own library. <laughs> uh, I think back at my, I think back at my mum's place, I think I've got about 40 cases and crates of books up in the wow. attic and down in the, um, down in the cellar and they all need a home. So I've always been a massive reader, especially history. Um, the bulk of um, my books are all made up from history. Anything from ancient history to classical to me medieval European. Um, so it's always really interested me. So the so my first novel was a historical fiction. Um, it's called Voices of the Midnight Winds. Um, you will find it on several lists. You know, it's the worst selling novel in the UK in 2012. <laughs> 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 and it's set in two parts. It's a um, it's a tragic love story, um, and it's initially set in Persia around about 500 AD, so roughly about the time of the fall of the Roman Empire in the East. Um, but then the bulk of the novel is then told in past tense, um, and it's about um, two people um, in Rome during the reigns of Caligula, Claudius, and then Nero. Um, and then over to Britain for the Roman occupation and the Boudicca's Rebellion. Wow. So how many, loves do you ha how many novels do you have written so far? So I have one full novel published. I have two, um, I have two pieces published that are part of collaborative works. Um, so you have coffee table books. Um, and I have two no, two manuscripts, one that I've almost finished and another one that I'm about halfway through. Um, and I'm now already, I'm already scouting around. I have a few tentative offers on the manuscript that I've almost finished, which is very different to everything else. That's what I was about to ask you. There is some connection between them. That is a totally different... Oh, God, no, no. My next one, um, I've had a lot of fun writing this one. It's been very cathartic. Uh, it's to crib a phase. It's called No Fats, No Femmes, No Asians. I survive Grinder, um, <laughs> <laughs> and it's basically a narrative, which is just a collection of my Grinder experiences over the past four or five years. Um, and I've had I've had so much fun writing this. Uh, it's, it's been quite cathartic as well. There is some stories, uh, uh, like there is some story that you had through your. Grind. Oh, they're all mine. Period. Uh, they're all mine with a few, and a few of those are flagged with a few um, stories from my friends that have been included on it. And it's been, initially when I started writing it, it was just a funny narrative. Um, it started when I came home from Edinburgh to London. I'd just come out of a relationship that ended quite badly. Um, and it kind of starts there, and it's a narrative of my time in London and my grinder escapades. You know, there's some really funny ones, there's really hot ones, um, there's really disturbing ones. <laughs> and putting it into a narrative, um, and then including some of my friends. Uh, but then also, as I was writing it, there was a, there was kind of, um, there was like a message that was coming out as I was writing it about the way that people act and interact on dating apps and especially on places called Grindr where kind of like internalized homophobia and racism and segregation and you know segregation within segregation and making a minority group out of a minority group inside of a minority group and just some, and just some really boring behavior that people display that's just not acceptable um, but it's easier to say it because you're hiding behind the phone and a profile so you can say things so you can have um you know like a, a line in your profile that says you know no, no fats no femmes no agents it's like it's not cool <laughs> i'll tell you something very interesting about that Stephen. i i had an interview um uh, last year with someone who um who runs a podcast as well like glbtq and um, in america and uh, we did the interview after he, I, I participated on his show and um, he, he, we talk about that. And actually I'll tell you something now, this is very interesting. Yeah. 
my own, my personal way of seeing is if on grind of course i i think i think grinder you can find anything there you can find people looking for relationship you can find people looking for sex you can find people to waste your time you can find people to look for hookups it everything is in there you know what i mean yeah. i think you can find it you can find a relationship you can find anything you know if you look whatever you look you can find there just something that i uh if i that uh, i I, I kind of find a bit, a bit no, a, a, a very negative about the, the not just grinder, but the, the the apps dating itself and people they put there. Oh, I'm not into, uh, I'm not into this, or don't contact me if you are this, you know, if you are, let's say, white, black, Asian, ginger, um, tall, or you know, short or whatever. The thing is, what I believe is, if you don't fancy those stereotypes. It's okay. I mean, all of us we have our own way of, you know, yeah. we have our types, but you don't need to express there. You don't need to put yeah, there. Don't, don't contact me. Do you know what I mean? Because the thing is, I, I find this as a and what it's like a, a, as a negativity, it's anger there. Come on, yeah, if it's those... kind of behavior that it's um, that it brings out in people. I mean, when have you ever seen anybody in a bar go over and start talking to somebody? Yeah, either with a bag on their head with his hanging out or <laughs> or chatting to somebody and somebody saying, you know, sorry, I don't like blacks. It's like, <laughs> you just don't do that. Oh, totally. And the thing is as well, the, the thing is, what I believe is, uh, for example, if I would, if I would, if I would, I'm on those apps and I, if I'm going to check and if I, if I see someone expressing themselves this way, I'm not going to feel interested to contact this, this person, not even though if this person is my type or even if I think that I'm I'm his type, I wouldn't feel like contacting this person because the way they are expressing themselves is a very negative way. Do you know what I mean? So I think those people, um, I mean, I think when they when they express themselves this way, in in a, in a lot of ways they are shutting doors, they are closing doors because people they're not gonna contact them for some reason. They're gonna see some, you know, you don't need to. It's fine if someone contacts you, uh, you know, if you don't if you don't fancy the person, not your type. It's okay. You can tell. I'm sorry, you're not your, my type, or whatever. But when you express yourself this way in this profile, I find a bit. Um, it's one of my pet peeves. Let's say I find a bit like. Uh, um, sad, in a way, sad, it's, you know. It's extremely unkind. It is. It's, it's it, unnecessarily unkind. Totally, totally. You can say, okay, I, I'm into this, I'm into that, I like this, I like that, but it's to say, okay, if you, I've seen some people say, oh, if you are this, don't contact me. You know what I mean? I'm not into this. My God, I mean, it's a, it's an angry there. I can see like an angry, you know, person there, like trying to express themselves. I think we are just closing doors, I believe. Very interesting I mean, thing. I, mean, I think it's, I think it must be very interesting, funny writing this novel because I'm sure you can, there's so many stories that people, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna connect themselves with. They're gonna find themselves in the same situation. I, mean, I, I had to do a bit of a wellness check on my friends and just make sure it was, <laughs> I was like, do you mind if I use your real name? <laughs> this is okay. And if not, I can promise you that your mom is never going to read this. <laughs> I can actually, I can share I can share with you if you'd like in private. I can tell a story that I had I, I had on on the those apps that uh, I found very. It's for me. I found quite funny, interesting. I can I can share with you and uh, yeah, maybe can be part of your love okay. as well. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Next question for you is: What makes you the saddest? Um. Oh God. Various things. Um. I think sometimes feeling a little bit, and it's been quite, it's been very hard, especially over the past few years with the pandemic, because uh, I, I live with depression and it's something that I usually manage very well. Um, I have a great group of friends around me. If we, and I just, I have my coping mechanism for when I'm having really poor time. But I think especially over the past couple of years, there's a lot of the time there's not been that, you've not had the option to be able to deal with it as you usually would i.e. going up to meet up with somebody or just doing some... It's like, I know that if I'm heading towards an unpleasant spell, I will always throw myself into my work. I'll exercise, spend some time with my friends, but then also make sure that I've got a bit of... that I have some time on my own. Um, and I think over the past couple of years, it's been very easy since the pandemic started just to feel extremely isolated and lonely and not have a way out of it um, and I think that's made me extremely sad over the past couple of years. When, when things are a little bit more normal and we're not in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, uh, unkindness in general makes me sad. 
Yeah, totally agree. So it's so simple and easy to be kind, and it? it doesn't cost anything yeah. for you to be kind to people. A lot less energy to be nice than it is to be a dick. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, there we go. I think for you to, it takes much more of your energy to be unkind than to just being kind. Actually, you don't, it, being kind you just bring good things for yourself, for your soul, for oh, yeah, your spirit. You put it out, yeah. you get it back. Absolutely. Next question, Stephen. Let's do it. Okay, next question is, if you could have a cup of tea with a fictional character, who that would be and why? <laughs> Just the one. Um. Oh god, that's really hard. <laughs> I'm gonna make cups of tea with a lot of people. <laughs> Do you know what? I would like to have a sit in a cup of tea and a smoke of a pipe with Gandalf. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Just because he's Gandalf and he's the man. I'd like to sit outside Bilbo's Hobbit Hole on a nice summer's day with a really long pipe, having a cup of tea with Gang Gandalf, blowing smoke rings, and that's all I'd want to do. Wouldn't necessarily want to talk to him. <laughs> Just to, to be around him. Yeah, blow smoke rings. <laughs> Next one, let's do it. Stephen, before the next question, tell me um, what's the most exciting part? What's the best part of running a, a jazz pub in London? And of course, there's always a challenge part as well. What that would be? Um, the best part is it's 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 part of an industry that I love, and I've worked it my entire life. And I, the best part for me is just being able to talk to people all day. That's and I love that. That's that's my job. I, you know, I employ people to do my actual work. I just, you know, I, I get to, I really enjoy talking to people. Um, the challenges are, especially with um, with it being a small independent business as well, is no two days are the same. And everything always happens at once. There's never, you know, something goes wrong on one day or something will go wrong on another day. It always happens at the same time. And it'll always be at the worst time as well. So it'll be at like, nine o'clock on a Friday night when the place is full, the music's playing, and in the space of three minutes, the bartender's chopped his finger off, the toilet's exploded, and part of the ceiling's caved in, all at the same time. <laughs> and then the challenge is, is quickly prioritise it. It's like, right, I see blood, so you're first. <laughs> and then we'll do all the rest of it. Uh, and, uh, yeah, yeah, carry on. And the, I, think, I think the biggest challenge as well is the people factor as well. Especially when, and again, it keeps coming back to this as well, because we've been into lockdown and opening again and lockdown and opening again. People's attitudes and the way they've behaved in public have changed drastically in the past few years. Whereas last year when we came out of the lockdown, um, the atmosphere in general was wonderful in London. Everybody was really excited to be back out again. It was great. But then somewhere along the lines, midway through the summer, that's it turned and it was less fun and people just it's hard to describe people's behavior was appalling a lot of the time a lot of real entitlements um you know my my team were overworked <laughs> extremely tired because it was busy constantly all the way through yeah. which was great for the business absolutely it was really starting to grind my team down and i think keeping morale up when people's behavior was so strange as in like feast or famine nothing in between it was either these really big highs or these absolute <laughs> it was and there was no happy middle ground i see but i love it <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the busiest time uh, is always the weekends like uh, friday saturday the busiest time well no actually i have live music on midweek so monday tuesday wednesdays um, and then, I mean, weekends are always busy, but I have a really big following for the live music and a lot of good bands. So, such works. It's, it's busy all the way through, and that's how I intend it to stay. <laughs> let's say something now. Let's say people watching the interview, they would like to come to your to to the to the pub to the jazz. To what they gonna find something unique there that they cannot find anywhere else in other pubs in London. There's something special about the place. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I'm literally like one of four venues that serves Cajun and Creole food. 
Um, it's it's really not a cuisine that you find generally in the UK. Um, if you'd come down to it, great food. My bar's great. The music's great. Obviously, I'm amazing. Um, so <laughs> it's, it's just it's good times. There's there's kind of like there's a um, a saying on a couple of pieces of the artwork we've got, uh, which apparently is a is like a New Orleans saying, and it always comes under a picture of gumbo. Um, it just says be nice or leave. It's like that's that's exactly the philosophy of my pub. Be nice or you know you, you lose. <laughs> Amazing. And you are there most of the time as well. You are there. Yeah, pretty much. Very good. Next question for you is, what did you want to be growing up? I wanted to be a history teacher. Wow, interesting. Tell me about it. Um, well, I always, I mean, I always loved history um, and while I was at school, but it kind of has a, it never kind of came to fruition because it's, in a nutshell, at school, I was really smart really fat and really gay so i may as well have just have had a target on my back throughout the duration of my entire school career so i hated school i was bullied horribly the whole way through didn't really have any friends so when it came to the end of secondary school when everybody else was going off to college into university i thought no okay um and worked because the school had been such a horrible experience that i kind of like just threw that out um, so I started working and then I just spent a huge amount of time traveling instead. Which See? is far more fun. <laughs> and being gay, did you always have the support of your family or loved ones? Kind of. It's, so the part of the UK that I'm from, the East Midlands, it's a very... And you, and you have to be from the UK to really kind of understand the area where I'm from. It's, a, it's very white. It's very straight. It's very very white and straight it's the best it's the best way of putting it i would in the village that we lived in um i would never have been open again in the village that we lived in it wouldn't it wouldn't have been a safe environment for me Ooh. to have done that um and it was the same at school it was it was an extremely rough school um, <laughs> um so it was not somewhere where i could have done that and to be honest, growing up, um, I didn't really have that many friends. And mm -hmm. I come from a family that we're not close. Okay. Uh, affection is kind of replaced with indifference. I see. So I kind of, I flowered when I'd left school and I met my friends who are my family now. Um, the friends that I have now, you know, we've been friends for 20 odd years, you know, it's two decades have gone and we're still all friends and we love each other. I moved into it and so that age I kind of I kind of I flowered I lost the weight I grew I went traveling I met all these wonderful people and just kind of you know, you know done with that and you got very fit as I can see <laughs> this is just from running a pub <laughs> and do you, know, do you know how heavy a beer barrel is <laughs> do you have siblings as well uh, I do I have two sisters I have both very, very different. Um, so my little sister, who's not so little now, she's 35. She's, um, she serves with the Marines. She's a mental health nurse with the Navy. Wow. Um, so she lives on the Navy base in the south in Plymouth. And my older sister, um, I've not spoken to it's about 20 years now, I think. So of the three children, we're all very, very different. <laughs> But you're still in touch with the, the, the youngest sister? Yes. Uh, in fact, she's pregnant. I'm going to be an uncle this time next month. So. Oh, oh my God. Beautiful. First baby. Uh, well, no, it's my, it'll be my second niece. Uh, my oldest sister has a, um, a daughter, but I've never, I've never really met her. Um, um, <laughs> but so this will be, yeah, this will be my first proper niece. Uh, it's going to be a girl and she's going to be called Amelia. Amelia? Yes. Oh, beautiful. I've got a niece called uh, Emily. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. She's 12. My God, she's going to be 15 years old now. My goodness. Mm. Time flies. My oh, God. I don't, you know, my, the niece that I've never really met, she's now 22. <laughs> it's like... Wow. Wow. <laughs> Time never stops. Time goes every day, never stops. <laughs> <laughs> Flying every day. Ready for another one? Mm, sure. Let's do it. 
right, Stephen. Next question for you is: What is the worst first date have you ever been on? Oh. Um, it was a long time ago, and you know what? It was actually it was the worst first date because it was my fault. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a oh god, what was it? It must have been about 15, 16 years ago. Um, it was a chap that it was a guy that I'd served. I was working in a bar. Um, I got he gave me his number. Um. And it's, it's not a very long story, this one at all. Um, I got in touch with him, arranged to meet up with him for a day at a pub uh, the next day. I was coming from work um, and I'd been drinking at work whilst I'd been there, for, um, excuse me, most of the evening. So by the time I got to this date, I was already a little bit tipsy. Um, <laughs> And it, was, it wasn't an eating date, it was a drinking date. So he kept ordering more wine and then we started on shots. And, and then I, I only vaguely kind of remember the outcome of it. I definitely remember throwing up on it. Um, <laughs> oh my lord! I think I, think I hiccups and just <laughs> all came up. Oh my god! Um, and then it's like the shots hit, and I kind of like that. And I, he was really nice. He took me home and made sure that I got home and got into bed. Uh, didn't see him again. Uh, <laughs> He had messaged the day afterwards asking if I was okay, and I was just like, oh, I can't, no. So I ghosted him because of that. <laughs> That's funny. And so that was totally my fault. Poor him. Oh, my God, imagine. <laughs> Poor you as well. Imagine the, 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 the embarrassment at the time. <laughs> Say about talking about dating, uh, Stephen, do you think London, like big cities, um, People, it's, do you think it's, it's hard for you to maintain a relationship or have, um, let's see, you know, this, a way of approaching a serious long relationship? What, what do you take on that, this, uh, in big cities like London? Um, I don't know. I mean, it all depends on the people. It all depends on what you're after. Um, I think online dating and apps have... It's kind of a catch-22, isn't it? In some ways, it's really good because obviously people who you use, who probably wouldn't have the confidence to walk up to you in a bar and start talking to you have a way of speaking to you. And especially for people who aren't necessarily out yet either, that it's a good tool for them. But then on the other hand, it, it kind of dehumanizes it, dehumanizes it a little bit. Um, and it all depends what you're after, I guess. Um, I'm very... So I, I mean, I have like, I have two settings. If I'm single, I'm a huge slut. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm completely unapologetic about that. And I'm fine with that because I really like sex, a lot of it as well. However, if I'm with somebody, I'm the world's most monogamous person. Because there's a reason that I'm with somebody and I don't want to not be with that person. So I think London law of averages, yeah, because there's more people but it all depends on the person, it really does. Um, and what I find is that I see a lot of now is the love match and the love connection is there, but there's an increasing amount of people who want to open it up. And monogamy seems to be a bit, you know, going the way of the dinosaur, <laughs> which, which whilst not for me, <laughs> um, I can see how it can work for some people because I mean, I have some friends who have been together years and years and years and they love each other and they have very set rules. And so every now and again, you know, as a treat, they'll, they'll get another boy in or they'll just, but that works for them because there's a conversation that happens around. It doesn't mean they love each other any less. They're just there doing what works for them, uh, which all actually makes it all very kind of interesting because no relationship is the same. So. My idea of love could be very different to my polyamorous friend's idea of love, where there's four people in the relationship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, they love each other just as much as I do one person. Absolutely. Actually, I had an interview um, with someone from Atlanta, and he talks about that. He got, uh, they are a triple, 
mm-hmm. and polyamory, polyamory. So he he talks about that a lot. The interview is going to be up. It's going to be out this week. Yeah. And uh, I was fascinating the way he was explaining as well as you said. I totally believe. I think there are no rules. What matters is if everyone is happy, if everyone is in the same page. If you know what I mean, there are no rules. If uh, people everybody have... should make their own rules. Absolutely. Um, and Absolutely. that's what that's what works for you. Absolutely. As long as everyone is agree, everyone is honest about their feelings, everyone is respecting. As long as, as, long as the other person's eyes are open, <laughs> there's consent <laughs> and a conversation has been made, knock yourselves out. And you're not breaking any laws. Yeah, number four. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, absolutely. I think they're all about their own rules. You know what I mean? Yeah. Their own rules. There are no, there are no way of right or wrong. It's just the way that makes people happy. You know what I mean? And I think nowadays even more people they are more understanding about that. I think as well. You know, I think nowadays with the technology, people they are more aware of information, or they are they are seeing as well other people um, way of you know what I mean with relationships, and they kind of. And they understand more about it and they put themselves in, in their shoes and they can try to understand as well a little bit more. Say about that, I'm the same as well. Actually, when I look myself 10 years ago, my goodness, I I see nowadays relationship not with different eyes. For example, I'm still, I, I'm still, I cannot see myself like an open relationship, but again, you never know. You know, I've been single, but I don't know if I'll meet someone, if, you know, we change our point of view, so our, our, our way of uh, approaching relationships, it changes as well. And I, I believe with the other person, your, with your partner, it can change as well. It, it can open your mind or in a different, it doesn't need to be open like a relationship, but it can, could be anything that maybe you're not uh, well educated before or you didn't understand before the knowledge. Now sure. you have the, and the conversation needs to be had as well. Um... Yeah. But also, I mean, there has to be 100% agreement from all parties as well. Because, I mean, I have some friends who, their open relationships totally work. Yeah. And, you know, the conversation is kept going. So there's no, you know, there's no inherent jealousy or anything like that because they're being very honest with each other. Yes, absolutely. I've had friends who have tried to open up their relationships and it's been the beginning of the ends. That's the thing. The other person started getting jealous, or yeah. one person's wanted it and one person hasn't. And yeah. The other person's only agreed because it's what their partner wants, and it gets really messy. It does. It does. And again, it, it's a challenge as well. I think for you to yeah. open a relationship is a big challenge because, you know, it can go in a very, you know, understanding a way, but there's always a, a challenge there because maybe this person might change their you know what I mean, way off and meet someone that could, so again, there are no rules, people, yeah. you know what I mean, I think all about conversations, all about understanding as well, and make both sides happy, that's what matters, mm-hmm. for sure. Three questions left for you, let's do it. <laughs> okay, Stephen, next question is, what makes you very sentimental? I think as I've been getting older, <laughs> um, I get quite sentimental about things these days. Um, I think um, it's usually conversations with friends about trips we've been on or things that we've done. Just because we, just because over the past couple of years we've all been hitting forty, so we're all hitting this milestone. So we've all, you know, there's been a lot of talk about stuff we used to do when we were in our twenties, um, <laughs> and it's. But it's been a really nice sentimentality. It's, we've, um, our friendship group, we've talked a lot over the past year or so um, about when we all met and how long we've been together. And it's been really pleasant. Uh, yes. And you know, it's usually after a couple of bottles of wine and then the photos come out. And DJ go kind of looking at photos before we all started going gray and white. <laughs> and we all had less wrinkles and smooth faces. <laughs> But there are more wisdom for sure, more understanding that comes with age. I mean, common sense hasn't grown as the years have gone on. But... <laughs> <laughs> Two questions left. Let's do it. Stephen, before the next question, tell me um, when you look back through these two years of, you know, this challenge uh, moment that the world has been facing with the COVID crisis what's the the biggest positive impact that brought to your life personally and what's the biggest negative impact that brought to your life this challenge time 
Um, I think it brought people closer. Um, it made, I think it really made people think about relationships and friendships and family um, because, you know, without exaggeration, pe people died. A lot of people died. Um, and a lot of people weren't able to uh, weren't able to say goodbye to the people that they loved either. Um, for example, a friend of mine in Brazil, um, his mum was taken to hospital and he never saw her again. She went into hospital, and never came back, um, and he's only just now finding out where they buried the bodies that they took out of the hospital. There, it's. I think it made I think it made us all appreciate each other a little bit more. I think. Um, and it got everybody out of the house because what we were allowed to do was exercise. And it was really nice to see that people were out exercising, talking to each other. I mean, because the first lockdown, you know, two years, it was in the middle of summer. It was brilliant. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, sitting in my garden, having a great time. <laughs> but then meeting up with my friends, you know, for socially distant walks and going out. And I was just, I thought that was really nice. We all started reevaluating what was important to us. It's so like me and my best friend, we qualified as personal trainers because we decided that we wanted to just stop smoking and stop being such trash bags and do something healthy with our life. <laughs> and, okay. uh, so we qualified as personal trainers and we got really healthy and it was it was a lot of fun. Um I think negatively nobody should ever surprise you with a video call. Ever. <laughs> It's true. I am not going to answer an unsolicited video call. If somebody's video calling me, I'm going to make sure I've got my hair done. I don't look like... <laughs> and there's nothing embarrassing in the background. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and there were, there were people, people wanting to video call where I was just like, look, I don't speak to you this much when I can see you. So why do I need to video... Why do you need to video call me every week? This is no. Go away. <laughs> Um, I was doing a lot. We just go. I was doing a lot. <laughs> I was just yeah, a video call's fine, but it's like I, I don't need one every day from somebody that I speak to maybe once a year. <laughs> but yeah. I, I think what it did do, and I don't know if it was the same around the world, especially for the UK. I think when it started happening, what became very evident is that there was a very me first attitude that came out with people. The hoarding of toilet paper, you know, stripping supermarket shelves, but it was a—it's now going to go down as the great toilet roll famine of 2020. Do you know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's like what exactly are you going to do with all this toilet roll? <laughs> I know it was weird to see that, isn't it? Yeah, I was talking to my plumber the same. Oh my God, what? What's the deal behind? But that said, it was a very how in some people it brought out this really lovely nurturing. You know, let's. The, help the people you know that we can people who can't get around it's like my friend um spent her time doing shopping for little old ladies who can't get out of the house yeah she'd up with this agency and she'd go and do the shopping for them take it over i signed up to volunteer at the nightingale unit at the excel uh, center um but then what you saw on the other side of it was just this very this, just this real kind of me first kind of attitude and um, something that i really took offense to is the amount of people posting feel-good porn on social media you know, like mm -hmm. filming themselves taking food to their grandma or filming themselves taking do, do you know what I mean stuff to yeah. people who couldn't but making sure it was a big show of it finding out you know look, look what a great thing I'm doing and it, it's like yeah that's great but you can do it without the camera just go and do it and tell us about it it's like we don't need to see you showing us what a fantastic person you are because now you just end up looking <laughs> absolutely no i totally agree i think if you don't do something you don't need to you know you don't, you don't need to put yourself as the cover of the 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 the, the, the you know what i mean the, the the nice um the nice thing that you are doing you know what i mean yeah it's like this pandemic was not your story so it's... I, yeah absolutely Next question for you is, what is the best present have you ever received and from whom? I think it was a picture from my housemates. Um, it's they, 
because they know I have a lot of history. So they found, it was just, it was like a really, it was something they found on Instagram. Um, you, you send in a photo of somebody and you can put them on another body. Um, and it's this really good, it's, it's huge, it's about this big. Um, and it's a photo of my head on Elizabeth I's body. Um, and it's in like a really big gilt frame. And it just, it's, like, <laughs> it's ridiculous, but it is by far, I think the best present I've ever received. Amazing. <laughs> it makes me laugh every time I look at it. I think it's fantastic. <laughs> Ready for the last question, Stephen? Sure. Let's do it, last question. Okay, but before the last question, as we were talking before about your next novel, about the grind, the uh, stories, tell me, um, do you remember the first, the, the very first person you met on Grinder? Yeah. Can you share how it was, how, uh, the, how, how the situation was? Oh yeah, it was terrible. Um, it was <laughs> a long time ago now. Um... I, it was a guy that I'd chat him to who was really cute. And it was just a real, just a bit of chat. He was really cute, quite twinky, nice looking. Um, and I meant, to, I can remember where it was we went to as well. It's a pub called The Mitre in, um, in West London. Um, and I got to the pub. And it was just a case of, there was absolutely no spark there. Um, the picture was at least a, a good five, six years old. Um, uh, we had a quick drink and like, it was it's really non-eventful. It was just a very, it's like, oh, I'm going to go meet a boy off this new app. Kind of like went and met him. It's like, oh, really? <laughs> I wasn't going to notice. <laughs> it's like, I'm going to have a drink then. I'm going to go. <laughs> so, so, yeah. <laughs> That's what the first person you met on Grider. Yeah. Amazing. Last question for you is, easy question. What do you like to cook the most? Um... I don't cook at all. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna change the question then. I'll change the question. <laughs> um, I I find nothing more depressing than cooking for one. Um, so I don't cook. <laughs> I'll get another pressure for you. <laughs> but what I do like doing is, is I do like cooking for people. So when things are a little like, bit off, I still like cooking then. So I. I like cooking, but it happens so infrequently. It used to be, I mean, it's been a few years now since we've done it, where me and my group of friends, we'd all meet up on a Sunday and we'd all take it in turns to cook a roast. Um, and they were the best days because we'd all just, we'd all just get around in the kitchen and we'd all just get hideously drunk as we're cooking, excuse me, as we're cooking. Um, we always had the same films on playing in the background. It was always The Never Ending Story or The Labyrinth or The Land Before Time or, <laughs> or The Dark Crystal. Um, and I would always do roast pork uh, with all of the roast veg and all the drippings. Um, and I enjoy doing that. I really, rather than cooking, I enjoy the process of cooking for, for a bunch of people. Um, it, it, I think it's a really lovely, wholesome way to spend some time. Um, so that's why I like it. Amazing, I'll take the answer then. I don't need to change the question. Amazing, I love it. Steven, it's not the end yet, okay? I Steve, I Steve or Steven? I'm saying right, Steve. Steve. So I only ever really get Steven if I'm in trouble. And that's oh, so, oh, so the N is really hard. You know, it's like Steven. I should have asked in the beginning of the I apologize, I should have asked the beginning of the, the interview. <laughs> Anyway, okay, Steve, so tell uh, it's not the end yet. Okay, let's play now the word association game. Okay, I'm going to give away some words and just tell one word that comes to your mind. Quick thinking. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. So, I hope you are enjoying the interview. Before we do the word association game, don't forget to give a like, don't forget to share this video, and also don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Just click on the bottom right there. Thank you so much and enjoy the word association game. Let's start with politics. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Religion. Uh, again, what? <laughs> One word for money. Hey, complicated. Love. Also complicated. <laughs> <laughs> One word for family. Ooh, very complicated. Um, in my case, aloof. 
Okay. One word for sex. Yes, please. Life. Life. Yes. <laughs> Fear. Um. Often. Friendship. The best. One word for desire. Covet. Regret. Always. <laughs> One word for success. Fairies. One word for wish. Three. Happiness. Always. One word for London. Crowded. One word for England. <laughs> Over. <laughs> <laughs> And um, one word um, to describe to describe your first novel. Painful. The last one now. One word. If you could define your your business, your uh, jazz pub in one word, what that would be? I think it can be two. I know it's, I'm going to swear again. Sorry. Fabulous. Hey, amazing. Let's pretend now. I'm going to meet your lovely best friend for a coffee. And I'm going to ask your best friend, tell me the most beautiful thing about Steve and tell me something that he still needs to work on to improve on. What your best friend would say. Okay, so I think my best friend to Anna. Anna would tell you that I have a lot of love and I care a lot about all of my friends and something that I still need to work on. Uh, it's probably not being so down on myself a lot of the time. And to not get drunk. Because drunk Steve is a nightmare. Um, so... <laughs> yeah, actually, we'll go with that. I think she'd tell you that I have a lot of love to give and I care a lot about my friends, but I am an absolute pain when I'm drunk. So we just need to bring it down a little bit. <laughs> Which way? You get too funny, you get too dramatic. You oh, get too just messy. loud and, uh, and it's everything. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> all the emotions in one place. Yeah, all of them. And you, and you'll get to hear every single emotion in one and they're all out of my body at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Let's play now, Steve, in the magic box and you can ask me a question. Okay, Steve, you can ask me a question now. Okay, so... You have to spend the rest of your rest of your life as a Disney as a Disney villain. Which one's it going to be? <laughs> oh my God! Oh my God! We that's all a, love a villain. That's a good question. Um, okay, Disney. Which one that would be? Wow! Actually, I worked for Disney Cruise Line for Disney World four years, five years ago um, oh, on wow. a cruise ship. Yes, I was there. I spent uh, uh, one short contract for four months. Okay, so the villains of Disney, my goodness, you need to help me out now with the villains. I'm not very familiar with them. I mean, um, okay. Magic Sense, the name. Magic Sense, yeah. Sense. Right, I'll go for this one. I will go for this one. Angelina Jolie. Yes, this one. Do you know why? I quite like to be Angelina Jolie, so yeah. Yeah, that's why. That's why I imagine when I watched the movie, she was so beautiful and elegant, you know, the same way she was very bad. And uh, I think to to be uh, in her in her shoes in her character as a Maleficent, I think would be a good uh, villain to be for sure, at least for for a movie or for a <laughs> just look to look nice and beautiful the way she was. Even though she was very bad, but she looked still beautiful and hot. <laughs> good girl. Steve, did you enjoy the interview? Did you have a good time? I did. This was fun. Thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time. I know you're a very busy man. You took the time for the interview. I really appreciate it. But before, before you go, Steve, I'd like you to share a positive message or a positive quote or something that inspires you in life. Yeah, it's a relatively simple one as well. Because um, I generally find that you find that the people who feel the need to tell you to be kind all of the time generally aren't the kindest of people at all. Um, and they're, you know, they're kind of gaslighting on that one. So I would probably just say, get up in the morning, brush your teeth, try not to be, it's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Very easy, simple. Simple. I mean, I live my life by it. 
And I manage two of those things, at least on a daily basis. <laughs> Not entirely all three. <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for the interview. And uh, one day I'll come to your to your desk. I'd like to come and see, say hello and uh, have a drink there and uh, um, right. listen to music. It would be nice. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, enjoy your evening. Bye-bye, Steve. Take care. Bye. So, did you like the show? Don't forget to give a like, to share it, and also don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you'd like to be part of the show as well, first, subscribe to our channel, and after that, just go to our website, www.williamandthemagicbox.com, and send us a request saying why would you like to be part of the show. And I'll see you there. Bye-bye, see you next time.